The morning's message is talking about more praise in your days. And of course, you can't have genuine praise apart from thanksgiving. Biblically, they're really one and the same. This is a, uh, a holiday that I think as Christians we can really get excited about. We are a people of thanksgiving. I remember a story you may have heard before about a uh, circuit riding preacher got old and it was time for him to retire. This is back in the days where these preachers would ride their horse from town to town. They'd do a little revival. They'd go on to the next town. And uh, he was a little older than his horse so he thought he'd sell his horse. Well he found a prospective buyer who came by and he said, I'd like to take the horse for a test drive. I said, fair enough. He said, but I need to let you know that, uh, you know, after all I am a preacher and this horse is not like typical western horses. If you want to go, you don't say giddy up, you say praise the Lord. If you want to stop, you don't say whoa, you say amen. He says he's used to these biblical terms and that's all he's going to respond to. He said, fair enough, I, I think I can handle that. He said, uh, I'd like to try him out. He said, help yourself. And so he hops on the horse and uh, they lived there on the edge of town. He said, uh, giddy up. And the horse didn't move. He said, oh yeah, 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 yeah. He said, praise the Lord. And the, so the horse took off and he started walking. He got out of town a little bit and he says, hey, seems like a good horse. He said, I wonder if I kick it up a notch. Praise the Lord. Horse started into a faster trot. Then he said, praise the Lord. And the horse went into a full gallop. And he thought, well, this is pretty good. The horse is pretty fast. But uh, all of a sudden he looked down the trail and he could see that the horse was galloping towards a cliff. He said, whoa, stop, halt. And the horse is charging up to the edge of this cliff and he's trying to think, what was that word again? He said, amen. And the horse locked his legs and stopped and went screeching right up to the edge of the cliff and all the dust billowed bass tumbled off the cliff and the man took a breath and he wiped his brow and he said, praise the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've got to know when to say praise the Lord in a church you know, when not to say it and what it means. Uh, we talk a lot about praising God and I found in the church that uh, real praise is something that is misunderstood both time and place. It's appropriate for us to talk about and study the subject of more praise in our days because it is a biblical theme. Over 290 times in the Bible you'll find the word praise. It's interesting, it goes all the way from Genesis to Revelation. The first mention of praise in the Bible you find in Genesis chapter 29 verse 35. When Leah gives birth to the boy Judah. And she conceived again and bare a son and she said, Now I will praise the Lord. Therefore she called his name Judah. It's very interesting that the word praise in Hebrew is Yuada, which means Judah, and it simply means praise. In Greek, the word is Ainos. Ainos is how you would say praise. But you know, I want to go back to that verse there in Genesis 35, or 29, verse 35. First time you find the word praise is with the son of the tribe, Judah, through which the Messiah would come. He was the lion of the tribe of praise. And it's appropriate that every Christian be a member of the prize, of the tribe rather, of praise. Praise should be part of who we are. Maybe I should start with a definition. Praise comes from the Latin proteria or to prize. It's uh, drawn either from the word to prize or to price something. And uh, matter of fact that's where we get the word an appraiser. And so the word praise means expression of warm approbation, approval, commendation, or admiration. To extol, laud, worship, to exalt a deity, ruler, or hero. To praise. Now not only are we talking about praising the Lord, but just if we were to talk in a more general sense of the, the word praise, everybody appreciates praise. 
I think everybody likes being told you did a good job, we like who you are, to extol something good that you've done or a talent you might possess. And uh, John Ruskin once said, when we fail to praise somebody that deserves it, two sad things happen. First of all, we run a chance of driving him from the right road for lack of encouragement. And we deprive ourselves, secondly, of the highest privilege of being a rewarder of him who deserves reward. You are given the opportunity of dispensing reward when you offer praise. Someone else said, Roger Ashkin, there is no such whetstone to sharpen good wit and encourage everyone in life as praise. It's not just in the schoolroom, it's true everywhere. Praise will sharpen and improve any situation, relationship, any person, provided that it's truly deserved and sincerely given. You've probably also known people that are always thanking and praising people for everything and, and uh, that's good and we all want to be around people like that but somebody once said, he who praises everyone really praises no one. If you have no rationing at all of your praise then pretty soon people begin to wonder how sincere you are. And so the praise ought to be genuine and it ought to be timely in the way that it's given. Everybody appreciates being appreciated. A pat on the back accomplishes a lot more than a slap in the face. Matter of fact, uh, there's probably a lot of you here who maybe have had fathers that uh, used to ration their praise a little too sparsely. Uh, my dad was that. Uh, he always wanted to get better performance and so you'd often hear the criticisms and se seldom would you hear the praise. Um, I think it was the Duke of Wellington, the one who conquered Napoleon at Waterloo, who was a very brilliant general, but he was also a very exacting officer and, and uh, gave out very scant recommendation to people. Very rarely expressed appreciation or praise for a job well done. And he recognized that was a flaw because at the end of his life someone asked him, if you could live your successful life over again, is there anything you'd do differently? He'd say, yes. I would praise more. Now that could probably be said not only of those in positions of leadership for people you're working with or parents, but I think that come eternity every Christian is going to say, you know, I wish during this life I had praised more. Because really, that's why we exist. We exist to give worship to God. You know, you really don't enjoy anything until you share it with somebody else. And if you see a beautiful sunset and you're by yourself, unless you can express praise to God for it or tell someone else that you elbow, isn't that beautiful? You really haven't fully delighted in it. Praise is the epitome of your existence. And so, uh, and the Bible's full of it. Matter of fact, I, I thought of this while I was just up there listening to the special music. You look in Luke 24. Typically, when you think about the Gospels of Matthew and Mark, they end with the Great Commission. And you think about the Gospel of John, it ends talking about uh, Jesus and his, his counsel to John and to Peter. But when you get to the end of Luke, it says in verse 50, he led them, this is Luke 24 verse 50, he led them out as far as Bethany, he lifted up his hands and he blessed them. Now it came to pass as he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried into heaven. Notice, and they worshipped him, and they returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and they were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. They went from worshipping God into the temple where they were occasionally or continually. Continually praising and blessing God. Christians if known for anything we ought to be known for people that praise God. Now there's a lot of misunderstanding about what it means to praise God. And some of this came from recent generations where some of the televangelists would have programs. I had one program called Praise the Lord. And uh, you might hear someone say the words praise the Lord 90 times during one show. And sometimes several times in sequence. It was just like vain repetition. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, that's all praise the Lord. And that would mean everybody starts raising their hands and waving them and saying praise the Lord, praise the Lord. 
that's not really what praise is. Because praise is where you extol, you identify, you specify someone's goodness, you specifically thank them for something specific. If you walk up to a stranger on the street and say thank you, thank you, thank you, they think you're mad. For what they'd say. You'd have to give them a specific. And so a lot of Christians have kind of, and, and I've done it too, will just say praise the Lord and we're, that's our way of saying we're giving credit to God but it's usually for something. You see what I'm saying? You're not praising the Lord when you just repeat in vain repetition praise the Lord. Because Jesus told us about praying in vain repetition. Did that make sense? Yes. I, I want to make sure sometimes, I don't know if it's me or your expression, but I wonder if I'm getting through. <laughs> so just checking in with you. And it's okay to give each other encouragement. Everybody needs it. Does God ever encourage and praise people? Yes. Is praise only for God? No. You can read in the Bible about Cornelius. Does God praise people? Yes. Acts 10 verse 4. An angel comes to this Roman centurion saying God has looked at your generosity. He's looked at your, your alms and your kindness. He says your prayers and your alms are come up as a memorial before God. God had been taking note of that and God sent an angel to tell him that he noticed. In the book of Job, does the Lord talk about his servant Job and speak of him in a praiseworthy name or way? He even said to the, uh, the devil, have you considered my servant Job that there's none like him in the earth? It's like he's bragging on him. A blameless and an upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. Notice he gives the specifics. By the way, Jesus said that if we speak up for him, if we're not ashamed of him, God will not be ashamed of us and he will confess our name before the Father and the angels. This is exactly what happened where here God was confessing the name of Job before the throne of God and before the angels. Wouldn't that be something to have God praise us? Will Jesus say to those that are saved, Matthew 25, 21, well done good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the Lord, you've been faithful over a few things, I'll make you ruler over many things. God is praising those who have done a good job, well done. How many of you wish that maybe your parents had said that more to you? Well done, good job. To be encouraged, to be complimented, our Heavenly Father does. You know it really gets me. He even does it among those who weren't perfect. Was Abraham perfect? Did Abraham kind of uh, tell a half truth when he said Sarah was his sister? And uh, a couple of other things, taking an extra wife, that surely wasn't the right thing to do. But when God then refers back to Abraham, because Abraham accepted the blood and sacrifice of the Lord, God looked upon him and he said, Abraham is the one who kept my commandments and he's done that which was right in my eyes. What about David? Did David live a life that was worthy of praise? Well, for the most part, he made some big blunders. And yet listen to what God says about David. 1 Kings 14, 8. And yet you have not been as my servant David, who kept my commandments, who followed me with all of my heart, to do only that which was right in my eyes. Well, does God have a bad memory or had God forgiven him? Looked upon David and he praised him. He also looked at the big picture. Now, so many people when they look back on a life where there's been a major mistake, that's all they think about. And they won't think about the good things they may have done. Uh, sometimes history is unfair in the way that it judges, but God praises people. John 1.47, Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and he said, Behold an Israelite in whom there is no guile. He didn't say he was sinless, but this was a very honest man, Nathanael. And Jesus brought that out and he was encouraged by it. Now, of course in the world, we sometimes are more preoccupied with the praise of men than the praise of God. If you're going to seek praise and, and don't live to try and get praised by men, be more concerned with the praise that comes from God. John 12, 43, for they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. I want God to be pleased with me. Now I think everyone knows that uh, our primary purpose in life is we live to worship and praise God. Bible begins with worship, it ends with worship, the final battle is over worship and so praise is central to that and we need to understand it. We need to spend more time praising God. We worship God for who He is we praise Him more specifically for what He's done. We thank Him for what He's done. 
But so often, and it happens in relationships, it happens in marriages, in families, with workers, when someone's doing a good job, we sort of take it for granted and we forget to express appreciation. I was uh, thinking about all the things I had to do to prepare for this trip. Just came back from a trip, getting ready to go on another trip. I unpack, get used to the time zone. Now I got to go and get used to another time zone. And I get real busy. And all of a sudden it popped into my mind um, how hard everybody at the Amazing Facts office works. Especially during this time of year. And I thought, little voice of Doug, when was the last time you told him that? I'm a little like my father, you know, you just take everybody for granted. And so I sent a little email to the office, and I don't, I'm not very eloquent that way. And, but I said, you know, I just want to tell everybody how much I appreciate the hard work and all the sacrifice that you invest. And all of a sudden I got all these email back from the people in the office. They just were so thankful to get that little bit of, it was just a sentence or two of encouragement. But sometimes we forget to express it. And uh, sometimes you think, well, you know, I've done it before, and we forget how long it's been. It's something you need to do frequently, kind of like painting the Golden Gate Bridge. You're never done. As soon as you're done getting to one end, you're starting at the other. And you should never really be done expressing appreciation. Like the husband, his wife said, you never tell me you love me anymore. And he said, well, I told you when I married you. If I change my mind, I'll let you know. <laughs> and let's face it, we're all that way sometimes. I remember at the end of the year, it usually happens about this time of year, Karen and I, you know, some people give monthly to different ministries and at the end of the year we think about supporting, we support, you know, a spectrum of different ministries and, and, I, and I thought, oh, well, yeah, we just gave to them and Karen will get out the checkbook and I, you know, you think it was just last week and she'll say, uh, Doug, it's actually been two years. <laughs> and have you ever felt, found that before? And I went to the doctor. And he said, you know, it's time for your checkup. I said, I just saw you a couple months ago. And the receptionist I was actually talking to, and she said, uh, most people, you better double whatever you think. You think it was a couple of months ago. It was actually a year ago. I said, no. I just had my teeth cleaned last month. No, it's been six months. And sometimes we lose perspective of how long it's been. Well, when it comes to showing appreciation and thanks, trust me, it's been longer than you probably think since you told somebody that you appreciate them. And so, just to be sure, do it more frequently than you might anticipate. Erwin Lutzer said, Praise is an act of worship. And if we haven't learned to worship, it doesn't really matter how well we do anything else. If we're not learning to praise, it doesn't really matter how well you do anything else there will be people in heaven that maybe went to church on the wrong day but there won't be anyone in heaven that doesn't praise God so if we don't get that right we got it all wrong heaven is filled with beings that praise God God is praised in heaven Revelation 7 verse 10 and there's several verses I could read these angels around the throne of God they cry with a loud voice saying salvation to our God that sits upon the throne and unto the Lamb and all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and they fell before the throne on their faces and they worshiped God saying Amen blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever they're thanking and praising him in heaven if we hope to be there we need to probably start learning to do that more here Again, Revelation 19, verse 5. Last place in the Bible you found the word praise. And a voice came out of the throne saying, Praise our God, all his servants, and all ye that fear him, both small and great. If we're servants, we praise God. Isaiah 6, verse 3. He had this vision of heaven, and these angels by the throne of God are saying continually, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. These are covering angels by the throne of God. What was their job? They were to praise God. Have you ever considered that the transition point for Lucifer when he stopped being a cherub and started being the devil and Satan and a rebel? When he ceased to praise God. 
when he began to frown in the presence of God and want the praise for himself instead of being willing to offer it freely to God he then ceased being that angel and he transitioned into being a rebel and what do you think dis distinguished the fallen angels from the good angels I can guarantee you the fallen angels stopped praising God and I think that uh, some people fall, they backslide in their experience when we forget to thank and to praise God for all the blessings that he's again given us. All of creation praises God, not only in heaven but even here on earth. Luke 19 verse 40, when Jesus was coming down the mountain and all the children were crying out saying, uh, praise the Lord and Hosanna, Hosanna. And they told Jesus to tell them to be quiet. And he said, if these should be quiet, even the stones would immediately cry out. Very nature would praise God. Psalm 148 verse 5, you find a lot of praise in the Psalms. It says, praise the Lord, praise the Lord from the heavens, praise him from the heights, praise him all you angels, praise him all this host, praise him sun and moon, praise him all, you know it's strange that some people worship the sun and the moon, the Bible says the sun and the moon worship God. Praise him all you stars of light. Praise him you heavens of heavens and you waters that be above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord for he commands and they were created. You go to Psalm 96 verse 11 and 12. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let the sea roar in the fullness thereof. Let the field be joyful and all that is therein and all the trees of the wood rejoice. And you've heard that song. All the trees of the field will clap their hands talks about nature praising the Lord. Some of you have heard a dog barking at night. You, you thought it was plain old noise. Maybe he's praising God. <laughs> Just sounds like noise. And let's face it, when Christians are out in the world praising the Lord, sometimes the world thinks we're just making noise. But God knows that what it's coming from. Psalm 150 this is the last Psalm. Matter of fact you could read that whole matter of fact I'm gonna do that real quick. If you go to Psalm 50 Psalm 150 verses 1 through 6. Praise the Lord. This is the last of the Psalms. I think there's a reason that you find this word so frequently here. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet, with the salsa tree and harp. Praise him with timbrel and dance. Praise him with stringed instruments and organs. Praise him with the loud cymbals. Praise him on the high sounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath, that's not just talking about people, everything that has breath praise the Lord. And then it ends, the last words in the book of Psalms are praise ye the Lord. That's a command that God is inviting us to praise him. So even the very creation praises God. And you want to praise him while you're alive. You know in the Egyptian uh, tombs they would take some of their sacred writings and they'd praise Oris uh, and they inscribed it in the walls of their tombs. But uh, it doesn't do you any good to put it there. The dead aren't reading those. They're not praising their God. Matter of fact the Bible's pretty clear. Psalm 115 verse 17 and 18, the dead do not praise the Lord neither any that go down into silence but we will bless the Lord from this time forth even forevermore. So the best time to learn to praise God is when you're alive. We should be uh, comfortable praising him in public. And you know I think the devil has tried to intimidate God's people with the scorn of the world if you praise the Lord in public. Yes there'll be some people that look at you narrowly or or uh, think that you're making a spectacle. I'm not suggesting you make a spectacle. But don't be ashamed that you believe in God. Are the angels ever ashamed to give glory to God? Do they ever hide it? When you think about how many of the creatures in the universe believe in God, is it the majority or the minority? The vast majority. It's only an, a minuscule fragment of his creation on this planet that don't believe that he exists that don't praise him. Are you going to cow down to that small group that's going to lose in the end? 
and hide your praise because you're afraid of what they think of you? They're on the losing team. Or are you going to remember that angels are watching and don't be ashamed to give God the glory? For, you know, our founding fathers, you just look in the early writings and everything, all our anthems, it all talked about praising God. Uh, someone told me I've not been up there to see, but on, I've been in the Washington Monument, but I've not been on the cap. But the cap of the Washington Monument, there is ostensibly a brand, brass, bronze or a brass plaque and it says in Latin, praise the Lord. The whole idea was they had this, it's technically it was supposed to be a big um, sundial, looks like an Egyptian obelisk, but the top of it was supposed to point to God and say praise the Lord uh, when they made this. Uh, so, I mean, that was all intrinsic, but now you say it in public and I forget where I, I was, I had a ticket line I think in Australia just last couple weeks ago and something went wrong on my flight home and um, I had reserved the ticket and it looked like I had lost it and uh, I was a little disappointed because I was back by the restrooms which isn't so bad I'm not above that but when you're on a you know 14 hour flight and you try and sleep and you're right your seat is right next to four bathroom doors and all through the night the doors are opening and closing you you know hear all that flushing and those strange smells coming out it, it's not it's not where you want to sit if you don't have to and I know my planes pretty well I looked at my seat and I was way back in the back and I'm going oh no I, you know, I thought I had and I called Bonnie and said I thought I had a seat further up and, and I got to the airport three hours early I was a little worried about that long trip home and I went up to the ticket counter and said, I thought I had this other seat. And she did a little typing. She came over and she says, yep, you're back where you're supposed to be. And I said, praise the Lord. Here I was in Australia, all those people waiting for their flight. And at first I thought, oh, I forgot how secular they are here. And I thought, what are you afraid of? I am happy. Praise the Lord. <laughs> and so, you know, you shouldn't be afraid to express your praise. Do you notice that kids are not? Little kids, you know, we teach them their inhibitions. When they're little, they're very honest. They'll stand there right in line next to you and they'll say, wow, Dad, look at how big that lady is. And you go, shh, you're not supposed to. <laughs> they're, they just, they have no inhibitions. I remember, I forget who it was, one of our kids, when they were little, there was some pregnant lady in line, that's why I said that. And he looked right at her and he said, how come you're so big? <laughs> and you know, how many of you have had those things with your kids where you say, no, no, shh, shh. Well, you know, when they're little like that, they'll be singing Jesus loves me in the shopping cart going up and down the aisle. And they're, they think, look, if he loves me at church, does he stop loving me here at the store? They're not afraid. But we are not so inclined to sing hymns out in public because ah, that's for church. Well, the Bible tells us we we're, we're should be happy to praise him publicly. Psalms 109 verse 30. I will praise the Lord with my mouth. Yes, I will praise him among the multitude. Isaiah 24, verse 4. Praise the Lord. Call upon his name. Declare his deeds among the people. Publicly, in church and out of church. Matter of fact, you find an interesting story. If you look in your Bibles, Acts chapter 3. This is a great story. Again, written by Luke. Peter comes to the uh, beautiful gate and there's this man who has never walked in his life. He, he was lame from birth. The legs were gnarled and crippled so he couldn't walk and someone was kind enough they'd carry him each day and they'd set him down at the doors of the temple and he'd heard about Jesus but he had missed getting healed by Christ. He just was always in the wrong place at the wrong time. And so he had never been healed during all the ministry of Jesus. And he stood at the gate there and begged. He could not go in because he was lame. Do you realize that the cripples were not allowed in according to the Levitical law? And Peter and John come and they see this man and they could tell that he had faith, that he wanted to be healed by Jesus, but now Jesus had been crucified and he ascended to heaven. He's gone. And that's when Peter reached out. He took his hand. He said, Silver and gold I do not have, but such as I have I give unto thee. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. This is a great story. Bible says he took him by the right hand and he lifted him up. I'm in Acts 3 verse 7. And immediately his feet and his ankle bones received strength. And he leaping up, he stood and he walked and he entered with them into the temple. 
notice here, walking and leaping, he'd never walked before, but he's leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. Now you know, somebody said one time, a body is not really crippled till it ceases to praise. And if a person does not praise, then they are truly crippled. You might have a perfect bill of health from the doctor, but if you don't know how to praise the Lord, you are spiritually crippled. And yet you could be paralyzed from the neck down like Johnny Erickson was, but if you praise God, you're liberated. And so all of us should have something for which we can be thankful and praise Him and praise Him publicly as well. Again, Luke chapter 24, oh I read that to you already, blessing Him in the temple. Praise is something that we might need practice at. Um, how do you practice praise? Isn't that supposed to be spontaneous? Well, that's the best thing. But um, if you practice, then it becomes spontaneous. You know, I tell the boys this. They both practice different instruments. Stephen, the piano. Nathan, the guitar. And uh, the more you practice an instrument, the easier it is to play by ear. You got that? The more you practice something, the easier it is to do it spontaneously. That means it's okay to be disciplined about your praise because then it's easier to be spontaneous about your praise. So that means scheduled times of praise beside church once a week where we come together to worship God. Make a list when you have your morning prayer, I'm assuming you have it, of things for which you're thankful. Praise God for those things. If you practice this, praising God, discipline yourself to praise the Lord in the things you have to be grateful for, it becomes a lot more spontaneous when you get something new for the list. See what I'm saying? So it's something that you can uh, practice doing. You don't learn praise in a day, still quoting Erwin Lutzer here, especially since you may have been complaining for years. New habits take time to develop. You can begin today and practice tomorrow and the next day until it becomes part of you. God gives us blessings so we can give glory to Him. Most of the verses written about praise in God's Word were penned by men and women who faced crushing heartache, injustice, treachery, slander, and scores of other intolerable situations. And in the midst of all that, they learned to praise God. They disciplined themselves to praise God during the blessings so they could keep praising God through their trials. By the way, that was written by Johnny Erickson Tata herself. You know, uh, I'm not an expert in radio communications, but I know that there are different frequencies that go different distances. And I think the frequency that travels the farthest in prayer is praise. And if you want to get your signal through, uh, make sure and incorporate praise in part of all your prayers. Think about Daniel chapter 6, I think it's verse 10, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed and he was going to be sent to the lion's den, what did he do? He went to his upper room as he'd always done with his windows open towards Jerusalem and he knelt upon his knees and he prayed and he gave thanks three times that day. Could God work a miracle for him of deliverance? Because praise and thanks was part of his regular routine every day. He was able to do it during trial because he learned to do it during the times of blessing. So it's something that we can practice in our lives. The heavens rejoice. Oh wait, I got so many notes here that I'm missing, missing some of my points. Praise is not flattery. Some of you remember the uh, story of Snow White and that wicked queen. I don't even know who she was. Don't act like you don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and she'd go to the mirror on the wall, magic mirror. I still remember as a kid watching the wonderful world of Disney with my mom. And uh, she'd say something to the effect, mirror, mirror on the wall. Who is the fairest of them all? I don't know, something like that, right? <laughs> Huh? That's it. That's it? Yeah, so you know too. 
And the mirror would come back and say, oh, you're the most beautiful. Until, of course, told her about Snow White. But some of us think maybe God's up there in the sky like that the wicked queen who said, praise me, I am, praise me, I'm the one that gets all the praise. And God is asking us all to flatter him. Is God shallow like that? What's the difference between praise, real praise, and flattery? Flattery is when you tell someone something nice because you ultimately want something from them. You want to use this person somehow. So you're telling them what they think or you think they want to hear because you need them or you want to use them or get something from them. God is not asking us to praise him because that's the way we're going to get something out of him. It's true that uh, there, there are benefits that follow, but the reason to praise him is because it's more blessed to give than receive. You are blessed. You are transformed into his image. When you look at him and his goodness, you find out about his character, your love for him grows, you serve him better. And it's the purpose for which we're existing. He's not forcing it from us. It must be given willingly from love. Have you ever had to fish for a compliment? Do you enjoy it as much when you got to fish for it? Someone said, uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes, a famous writer and physician, uh, uh, unlike his brother, John, who was very humble. Matter of fact, John said the only compliment he ever got was when their, their nanny was combing his hair and she commented to the mother, his eyes aren't that crossed. She said that was the only compliment he remembered ever getting. <laughs> Oliver Wendell Holmes, his brother on the other hand, much more famous, he kept every compliment anyone ever wrote him, he kept them in a journal and he liked to open it and flip through it. And look at all the praises and nice things that people had written to him or said about him. And as he got older, when someone would say something nice about him, he would always pretend he couldn't hear him. He'd say, could you please say that a little louder? <laughs> so they'd repeat it. Someone said, nothing will improve a person's hearing like praise. People are typically bored listening to someone pay them, unless they're uh, paying them a compliment. So flattery is not praise, it's different. It should be given, uh, praise is not flattery rather, it should be given from the heart because God is worthy and we're blessed by doing it. And then I want to make sure that I have also uh, covered the, the idea of praise in song. Uh, God wants us all to sing his praises. Now some of us just feel like we probably shouldn't do that and leave that to others. It's like the uh, mother that bought the baby grand piano for her daughter. Told a friend about it. A couple weeks later, a friend said, well, how are her piano lessons going? She said, well, we sold the piano. We bought her, bought her a clarinet. Said, Why'd you do that? She said, she can't sing with a clarinet. <laughs> but that shouldn't be your attitude in church. Is all of us together kind of balance each other out. And even for some, it might be making a joyful noise we, sh noise, we should all sing. Uh, when that group was singing up front just a minute ago, I don't know if they caught it, but I was humming behind them because I knew, do you know I can hum in several languages, <laughs> actually. Everybody should sing. Some churchgoers seem to have picked up the idea that singing in church is for singers. No, the truth is that singing is for believers. The big question is not do you have a voice, the question is do you have a song? So everybody should be able to sing to the Lord. Let me give you the scriptures. Ephesians 5, verse 19 and 20. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, seeking, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord always, giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to even God the Father. We all have a song that we can sing to the Lord. Now again, we're not talking about singing in vain repetition any more than we talk about praying in vain repetition. Now, I, and I like, we should all sing new songs. You know, there's a lot of debate in the church about what they, they call maybe contemporary worship or traditional worship, liberal worship, conservative worship. You all know that I fall on a more conservative side of that question. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't sing a new song. And I love some of the new praise songs. As long as they're scripturally sound, some of them have beautiful melodies. What I'm not real excited about is the repetition. And you heard me talk to you once about the 7-Eleven songs is what I call them. 
Um, you know, every now and then I stop at 7-Eleven. But you don't want to do your grocery shopping. It's a convenience store. It's something you do occasionally because you need one item. This week, I had stopped at a convenience store and I just got like a granola bar. I didn't have time for dinner. I knew I was going to get hungry before this board meeting was over. And so, but you pay much more than you'd normally pay. The grocery store is where you go for the nutritious food. And those hymns that are in, our, in your hymnal, and you might think they're old and stodgy, boy, they got good deep theology and some of them beautiful lyrics. But you know, it's okay every now and then. I like some of those praise songs. What gets me is the ones that say the same thing over and over and over again. That's why we call them 7-Eleven songs because they sing the same seven words 11 times, 11 <laughs> verses. There's this one song, We Exalt Thee. We Exalt Thee. And they were this one church where the people were singing it and they sang it over and over again and someone finally listened carefully and they heard a little girl behind them that didn't know the words and she was singing, We Exhaust Thee, O Lord. We Exhaust Thee, O Lord. <laughs> And you wonder <laughs> sometimes, I mean, does the Lord, does that really praise? If vain repetition's wrong, then the vain repetition in, in singing can be wrong also. It says, sing Psalms 47 verse 7, for God is king of all the earth. Sing praises with understanding. The songs we sing ought to have some intelligence and reason behind them. Psalm 146 verse 2, while I live, I'll praise the Lord. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Psalm 147 verse 1, Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God. It's pleasant, and praise is beautiful. So, do you have a song? I heard about a man that um, developed tongue cancer. And this is several years ago when some of the techniques for the surgery were a little more radical. And uh, the doctor had explained to him that they were going to have to remove a large section of his tongue and it was going to make it very difficult for him to uh, speak. And the man was especially concerned because up to that point he had had a beautiful voice. So in the surgery room everything was prepped and they're about to put him under. He said, doctor, is it true that I'll never be able to sing again? And the doctor didn't even have the heart to answer the guy. He just lowered his head and shook, shook his head. He said, well, before you put me under, he said, can I sit up here? I just want to sing one more time. And so there in the hospital room he sang an Isaac Watts song that said, while I have breath I will sing your praises. He said, is this again the last time I'm going to be able to sing? He said, the last thing I sing I want to sing praises to God. Do you have a song that you want to sing to the Lord? Praise and worship is the most profound way of expressing our love to the Father. God loves us he loves to be sincerely praised and worshipped. He doesn't want us to praise Him just through vain repetition. It needs to be from the heart. Something else that's beautiful about singing praises to God, it brings deliverance. I think we all remember the story about Jehoshaphat when he was surrounded by three enemy neighbors that were all coming at one time in the confederacy. The Edomites and Moabites and Ammonites were all going to attack Jehoshaphat. The kingdom of Israel to the north had already been conquered by the Assyrians. His army wasn't big enough and they prayed and said, Lord, what do we do? And they went into the temple and they were singing praises to God. And finally, the prophet told them to go out to battle. And they went out to battle and they stationed the singers out ahead of the soldiers. And while they were singing and praising God, marching off to meet the enemy, something went sideways with the enemy communications and they all turned on each other. And they all fought with each other right down to the last man. And by the time Jehoshaphat and his soldiers got there, they had annihilated each other. For the children of Edom and Moab turned on each other and then they turned on the, the um, people of Mount Seir. And uh, finally they got there and all they had to do was carry away the spoil. It took them three days to collect it all. And they were singing with joy in their hearts on the way home. They never shot an arrow or fired... Uh, I was going to say again, they didn't have them. Never shot an arrow, pulled their sword out of their sheath back then. The way they fought was through praise. wonder how many battles we've lost because we try and find some earthly means and may not know what to do, just praise God. Uh, another story, New Testament, Acts 16.25. Paul and Silas are in jail in the stocks. 
no way of escape, been falsely accused and beaten, they're in pain, miserable, and in those circumstances, in the darkest hour, what time is Jesus coming? Remember I talked about this last week? Darkest hour, midnight. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. They're singing in the darkest hour. Should we be praising God in the darkest hour of church's history? And we need to start now. They were singing in hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, so the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open. Everyone's chains were loosed. When they began to sing and to praise God, they got the victory. A miracle happened. Years ago, back to Napoleon, when his soldiers were about to invade Austria, they were camped outside a little town called Feldkrich. And the people in this little town, they didn't have very big walls or defenses, and they figured, what do we do? Do we fight? We'll probably be annihilated. The French soldiers were much more um, experienced and better equipped, much bigger army. They said, do we raise the flag and surrender? And they all gathered in the church to, to meet and say, what do we do as a town? And it so happens this was Easter uh, Sunday when this was happening. And the pastor said, you know, we don't know what to do. God knows what to do. Why don't we put it in his hands? Let's not surrender. Let's not fight. But let's ring the bells like we always do on this day. And so they began to just ring the bells in the church. And the French heard that and they thought, oh no. They're rejoicing because the Austrian army is probably on the other ridge and they weren't really prepared to take on the whole Austrian army. And so they panicked and they fled, just like in the Bible. They just decided to praise God and ring the bells and let God take care of it. And <laughs> Napoleon's army withdrew. Isn't that something? You get the victory when you turn it over to God and praise Him for His power. Well, we've got a lot of reasons to praise the Lord. And you know, I thought to myself, uh, Doug, this service really wouldn't be complete if I just stand up here and pontificate on praise. Uh, and so I spoke to a couple of our families. I just grabbed them without hardly any warning. And I asked if they'd come up for a moment. So why don't you come on up? I think the Renhifos and um, Rich and, and Diane and who else? was Eric and Debbie. Uh, why don't you come up here for a minute? And I said, just think about something you'd like to share in uh, a few words about how, what you'd like to thank the Lord for. And I think we should hear from at least part of the church family. I, I thought what might happen if I just started tossing the microphone out, out into the audience, but you never know what to expect then. So I just kind of tap some people. You got a mic, Rich? Why don't you start? You know, I want to thank the Lord and praise his name for this Thanksgiving time specifically because we were able for the first time to have all our family together over Thanksgiving. Uh, which is, of course, always a blessing. It's been about seven, eight years since that's happened. I also want to thank the Lord for this past year in that he's uh, granted us another grandchild, and the name is Savannah. And a, that's the second one with the third one on its way with Kimberly. I want to thank the Lord also that I have daughters and son-in-laws that want to serve the Lord with all their hearts and that they want to raise their children to also serve the Lord. It's very precious when you see Troy folding his hands and giving thanks to the Lord for what uh, the Lord has provided him. So I thank the Lord for all that. Amen. Who over here? May your tribe increase. You got the father of Zalafa had here, huh? Well, Devin and I, we've also um, started the church growth movement, kind of like. Uh, <laughs> the McSherry's here, and, and uh, we've been so blessed. Thirteen months ago, we had a wonderful little boy, and the Lord has decided to bless us again with another child. And so I'm just uh, so grateful for him for taking care of all of our needs and, and for providing Jack a sibling. Amen. So in case you didn't get that, Debbie's expecting. <laughs> Amen? Me? Um, I've always praised the Lord with every prayer for the lovely wife that he has given me and for my family. 
I have truly been blessed uh, with my wife Elizabeth after all these years. But another thing that I am thankful for is for this church and for the wonderful church family that we come to talk to every Sabbath. It has truly been a blessing every Sabbath that never fails. We are always spiritually fed. I am never left here hungry, thirsty for more. And I thank the Lord for the wonderful pastors and Pastor Doug and his ministry and all the other elders and deacons here. This is a wonderful true church, and I'm sure that every Sabbath, if you make it a habit of coming here, you too will be spiritually uh, fed, and your love towards Christ will get uh, closer and stronger. And I praise the Lord for that, Pastor. Elizabeth, were you going to say anything? You know, I, I need to say something. Uh, our kitchen crew, it works so hard every week. And we forget to say thank you. I, I want to thank them for their hard work that they do every week, and, you know, preparing those meals for us and for all of us, our guests. And I want to pray the Lord for our pastors. You know, we're so blessed in this church. We have four pastors that we love so much and their families. And uh, we praise the Lord and for all of you. For, you know. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. God bless you. You know, I just wanted to, uh, I want to add my appreciation for my family. Very, very thankful for Karen and the boys and such a support. It's difficult being married to me. Did you know that? <laughs> and having a dad that's traveling. <laughs> and, so, but I, and I also not only am very thankful for the family. It's wonderful having our parents-in-law, Bonnie and Ed, here to, to uh, be so close by. I wanted to add exactly what Elizabeth said. I am so thankful not only for our congregation here, you are a wonderful church. Believe me, I've seen a lot of churches, and I'm not just saying it. And I'm so thankful for our staff here. Pastor Steve and Mike and Harold and Melissa in the office and the, everybody that helps. We're just so grateful. We've got a wonderful team here, and God is truly blessed. And I pray that uh, he'll bless you in the season ahead. You know, I uh, heard a story that they had a gathering at a convention in Omaha a number of years ago. But uh, they gave everybody that came into the conference a helium-filled balloon at the beginning. And it was an outdoor meeting. And they said, if at some point during the service today, when you feel that you want to express praise to God because you have it in your heart, just let your balloon go. And so as they were going on with the service, you know, every now and then you'd see these balloons go up and the pastor would say something inspirational, a flurry of little balloons would fly up. But what they observed is at the end of the service, one third of the people still had their balloons. They had never really let their praise go. And how sad. They had to bring, bring it home and watch it slowly lose its lift and turn into a, a pile of sagging rubber in the corner somewhere. You want to let it go while it flies. The living praise the Lord. Has God given you something to praise Him for? Has He given you something to be thankful for? Thank Him. You know, the more you thank Him, you pave the way for future benefits. Father in heaven, Lord, it is our desire that the words of our mouth, the meditation of our hearts, the praise in our voices will be acceptable in your sight. Lord, I pray that you'll help us to add more praise to our days. I pray that we will practice praise so it will come more spontaneously at the appropriate times. Help us not only to praise you in this house of worship, but help us to praise you before the multitude, the world that is lost. And we know that soon a midnight hour is coming, and I pray that we can be praising you now so we're prepared to praise you then. Bless your people, Lord. We have, have so much to thank you for. Instead of focusing on our misfortune and our trials, help us to focus on your goodness and our blessings. Be with us as we go from this place that we might be a people from the tribe of Judah, a people of praise. We ask in Christ's name, amen. amen. The study today is dealing with the subject of Revelation's Lake of Fire. Now we're talking about Bible prophecy and there's a lot of misunderstandings on this subject. Actually what I'm going to share with you is good news. Now this is the main thing I want you to understand in this presentation. Not only are there no people burning in the Lake of Fire yet, 
But the lake of fire is not eternal. People are punished. There is hellfire. You all hear me? I believe that. Some people say, Pastor Doug doesn't believe in hellfire. Yes, I do. The Bible does not teach it burns through endless ages. What did Jesus say the penalty for sin is? Sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. Question number one. How long will the wicked suffer in the fires of hell? This is where I really want to nail a point down. Jesus said, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give to every man according as his work shall be. Now, if, according to the popular myth, you're saved, you go to heaven, you're lost, you go to hell, and you burn there through eternity. If everybody burns through eternity, then everybody gets the same duration, don't they? Jesus said people get different rewards. That would mean that Adolf Hitler, who I'm assuming he's lost, hope that doesn't offend anybody, but that would mean that Adolf Hitler, he's going to burn the same amount of time responsible for millions of death, maniacal evil man, he's going to burn the same amount of time as some poor lost teenager that commits suicide. Does that sound just? Both get everlasting torture? Jesus said everyone is rewarded according to what he deserves. There's varying degrees of rewards, varying degrees of punishment. And he'll reward every man according to his works. Another verse that illustrates this in Luke chapter 12, verse 47, 48. That servant that knew his Lord's will and neither did according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. So one who knows and does not obey, he's beaten with many. Those who don't know, they're beaten with few, Jesus said, varying degrees. Fear not them that kill the body and are not able to kill the soul. I see that, Pastor Doug? The soul lives on. No, that's not what Jesus says. Jesus says, fear him who destroys soul and body in hell. Will the fires of hell eventually go out? Here's the point that you especially want to catch. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. The wicked will perish. The enemies of the Lord will consume into smoke. They will consume away. Behold, there'll be a stubble. The fire will burn them, like that stubble in the field we talked about. Just burn up. It says, they shall not deliver themselves from the power of the flame. There'll not be a coal to warm at, nor fire to sit before it. There's not even a little coal. There's not even a little flame. There's no heat coming off. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah are set forth and as an example, suffering the vengeance of what kind of fire? Eternal. eternal fire. Now, the wicked are burnt with eternal fire. This is what messes people up. The wicked are burnt with eternal fire. Pastor Doug, there it is. They're going to burn forever and ever. Wait a second. It says Sodom and Gomorrah are set forth, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Are Sodom and Gomorrah still burning today? They were burnt with eternal fire, but they're not still burning. I don't know. I think maybe what I'm standing on here is wood covered with felt. Let's suppose that this platform, I had matches and kerosene. I won't do this in a theater, trust me. But if I were to set this on fire and we weren't to do anything to stop it, and we just watch it burn, first I'd get off of it. This platform would burn up and it would never exist again. You might build another platform, but it's not this platform. This platform is burnt with eternal fire. That means the results of that fire are eternal. It's never going to be reassembled. It's gone forever. The results of the fires of hell are eternal. See, God is so merciful and patient, and there's even a resurrection for the righteous. There's even a resurrection for the wicked. But when the wicked go into the lake of fire, it is eternal fire. It is the second death. There is no resurrection. Does that make sense? That's what it means. They don't burn there forever and ever. And the smoke of their torment, someone's going to say, what about this verse, Pastor Doug? The smoke of their torment descends up forever and ever. Does that mean that they're tormented forever and ever? First of all, it says the smoke of their torment. Well, first of all, two things. You need to understand what they're talking about in Bible times in the context of what they're saying, and then understand the word forever the way it's used sometimes. First of all, Jonah, while in the belly of the great fish, chapter 2, verse 6, he prays. 
And he says, the earth with her bars was about me forever. He says, I was imprisoned in this fish. It was like Hades down here. It's kind of compared to death. How long was Jonah in the fish? And Jonah was in the belly of the great fish three days and three nights. Probably seemed like forever. Can you imagine three days and three nights in that? Oh man, smelled bad, felt bad, looked bad. Little bioluminescent fish flashing, and this is a jellyfish and things in there. Three days and three nights. Well, I would probably say it was forever. Have you ever had to, uh, you know, get a tooth worked on and didn't have proper anesthetic? How long does it last? Oh, it took forever. Feels like that. So the word is used that way. Let me prove it. I'll give you three verses in the Bible. I want you to go by the Bible. When a servant decided that he loved his master, even though he was allowed to go free, but he said, I want to stay with my master, they went through a ritual, and it says, he will serve him forever. What did forever mean? Oh, until he died. Rest of his life. Till he died. When Hannah brought her son Samuel to the temple, this is 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 22. She said, I'm leaving him here to be a priest, to serve before the Lord forever. Is he still there today? No, he's dead and buried. It meant until he dies. Again, 1 Samuel 1, 28, she said he would stay there as long as he lives. So the word forever was used, and later she clarifies it means as long as he lives. So forever and ever, in the Bible, it's an expression that means until the end of the age. It means from eon. You ever heard, the Greek word that's used there is the word eon. You ever heard someone say, I haven't seen them in eons. That's the same word that's used. It just means a long time. Now, what I'm sharing with you, someone says, Pastor Doug, you're sharing the, the philosophy of your particular denomination. Well, that might be, but it's also the teaching of a lot of great church reformers like William Tyndale. He believed exactly what I'm teaching you today. Martin Luther. A lot of Protestant churches were founded believing this. A famous um, Pentecostal minister named uh, William Fudge, he wrote a book called The Fire That Consumes. He told all the Pentecostals in the Assembly of God that he said, we're not going by the Bible. He says, if you go by the Bible, the lake of fire does burn up. Kind of turned them upside down theologically. And you've probably heard of a uh, great theologian, John Stott. He believes exactly what I'm teaching you today about the punishment of the wicked. So a lot of good theologians out there understand if you're going to go by the Bible, this is what it teaches. What is left when this fire of hell goes out? And it says, they will tread down the wicked for they are ashes under the soles of their feet. We're not going to walk out of the new Jerusalem and go, oh, ah, oh, ah, they're still burning. <laughs> no, they're all burned up. They're just ashes. And on the ashes of this purified planet, then God creates a new heaven and a new earth, wherein dwells righteousness. In the day that I shall do this, says the Lord of hosts. That's the second half of Malachi 4. It says, there'll not be a coal to warm at, nor a fire to sit before. It's burn up. Turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, he condemned them with an overthrow making them examples unto those who should after live ungodly. Now I read you one verse from Jude. Here's another one from Peter telling us Sodom and Gomorrah that were burnt with eternal fire. Peter says they're overthrown as an example of what God is going to do in the last days. Very much like what happened to Pompeii. Will a wicked enter hell in bodily form and be destroyed both soul and body? Is it physical? What does the Bible say? Matthew chapter 10, words of Jesus. If you've got a red letter edition Bible, these words are in red. Fear not them who kill the body but are not able to kill the soul. Here's the rest of that verse. Rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. I want that to sink in. I want to read it one more time. Words of Jesus. What's going to happen in hell? Destroy soul and body. If that's clear, say amen. Just humor me. I mean, I can't understand it. Well, someone says, yeah, well, the body, bodies burn up. Body goes to ashes, but the soul burns forever. Jesus said, destroy the soul and body in the hell, in the judgment. It's future. And they're annihilated there. If your eye offends thee, pluck it out. It's better for you to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hellfire where the worm doesn't die and the fire's not quenched. Okay, Pastor Doug, I was wondering if you were going to mention that verse. Wait, there it says, Doug, the worm doesn't die and the fire's not quenched. 
The word that Jesus uses for hell here comes from the word Gehenna. There are four words in the Bible used to describe hell. I'll get to those in just a minute. One of those four words is a Greek word Gehenna. Gehenna is the Greek way of saying Hinnom. The Valley of Gehenna, or the Valley of Hinnom, is mentioned in the Bible. It was outside Jerusalem. It was a very steep valley. It was a place where the pagans had set up idols to their pagan gods. It was considered a cursed valley. To discourage the worship of those pagan gods, the Jews made it the city dump. Every city needs a dump. They need a landfill. And the Valley of Hinnom was the landfill. Today, it's still pretty steep, but they're starting to build on the sides because they're short of land. And they would take all their burning refuse, dead animals, rotten food, they'd throw it off in there. It stunk. It was full of maggots, and it was smoldering. So when Jesus said, you're better off, he's using an illustration. Going to heaven, missing an eye or a foot or a hand. All right, stop, 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 stop. How many believe anyone in heaven is going to have a glorified body without an eye, foot, or hand? <laughs> so would we all agree Jesus is using a figure of speech here? Then to go into Gehenna, that's the exact word he used, where the worm doesn't die and the fire's not quenched. He said, you're better off. He said, some people say, I, I, I would like to serve the Lord, but boy, I just can't give up my cigarettes. I'd like to serve the Lord, but you know, I got this boyfriend, and I know he's not a Christian, but I sure like him. Jesus said, cut it off. It might be harder than cutting off your hand, cutting off your foot, plucking out your eye. There's struggles in taking up our cross and following Jesus. Sometimes that struggles. Can you imagine plucking out your eye or cutting off your hand? They got a snake in Indonesia, or is it uh, Vietnam, called a two-step. Supposedly, you get bit by this snake, you get two steps. And if you knew that was the only way to live, would you make that sacrifice? This is what Jesus is talking about. And he's looking right there at the city dump when he says that. So he's just comparing all of the lost are the refuse of salvation. They refuse to accept the Lord. They're going to be consumed and burnt up. They're cast out. Doesn't mean they're going to burn forever and ever and just worms. Can you imagine trying to walk around in heaven, tiptoeing around smoldering lost people and maggots? It's not what it's talking about. It's an illustration. Listen. He will thoroughly purge his floor. He'll gather the wheat into the garner, but he will burn the chaff with unquenchable fire. Unquenchable. Pastor Doug, there you've got it. They're burnt eternally with unquenchable fire. That means they're burning forever and ever. It's not what that means. What does unquenchable mean? Let's suppose I light a match. Okay, use your imagination. There it is, all right. Match is burning in my hand. It's just burning down, burning down, getting near my fingers. I don't want to burn my fingers. You spit on these fingers, you grab the top, turn it upside down. Now it's burning up the other direction. Top's already kind of smoldering ashes, but it's burning up. It burns, burns up. I didn't put it out. It burned with unquenchable fire. The word quench, it's a verb, it means to extinguish. Will there be any firemen running around and help putting things out? No, that's all it's talking about. The fire can't be put out. Now, let me prove what I just said to you biblically. You say, Pastor Doug, you say these things. It's in the Bible. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 27. Prophecy about the destruction of Jerusalem. But if you will not hearken unto me to hallow the Sabbath day, and not to bring a burden, even entering into the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, then I will kindle a fire in the gates thereof, and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem, and it shall not be quenched. Well, they did not repent. They continued to disobey the Lord. Nebuchadnezzar came. He burnt the city. He burnt the gates with unquenchable fire. There was nobody throwing water, no fire brigade putting out the fires of Jerusalem. It was burnt with a fire that could not be extinguished. So when the Bible says the wicked are burnt with unquenchable fire, it means there are no firemen running around in hell putting out the wicked. It's unquenchable. It's going to burn them with an eternal fire. You understand the language? What it's saying? Bible example there helps to illustrate that. It says, uh, Christ will declare to the wicked, it's more profitable for you that one of your members should perish than your whole body should be cast into hell. And that's what's going to happen. The whole body, spirit, soul is cast into hell. He said, rather fear him who's able to destroy soul and body in hell. The soul that sins, it will die. Will the devil be in charge of hellfire? Oh, do you think you can trust him? 
Make sure everybody gets fair shake. And people have these pictures of the devil. He's got his pitchfork. Make sure that you know, all the sinners cook evenly. <laughs> is the devil in charge of hell or is he going there? It says, and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire in brimstone. And again, speaking about the fate of Lucifer, I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of them that behold thee. He is going to be devoured. Never shall thou be any more. Now, if anybody deserves to burn forever, who is it? I mean, of all the people tempted around the world, and the one who tempted even the evil angels to rebel, it originates with this arch fiend called the devil. If anybody, he's worse than Hitler. If anybody deserves to burn forever, it would be him. But it says, I'll bring you to ashes. Now, he burns day and night until he's all gone. We don't know how long that's going to be, but he's going to suffer the most. But even he, the Bible says, never shalt thou be. God's not going to immortalize the devil. The Lord does not have a torture chamber off there in the cosmos somewhere while you and I go on through eternity enjoying bliss. It's going to be this place where people are being tortured. Whoever's not found written in the book of life is cast into the lake of fire. Does the word hell as, I'm sorry, does the word hell as used in the Bible always refer to a place of punishment? No, and this is where people get mixed up. A lot of times when you read the word hell, I sometimes even feel guilty saying that because I don't want you to think I'm cursing. Some people use the word that way, but it's in the Bible. It's being used typically as the grave. In the Old Testament, the word sheol is translated hell. It typically just means the grave. It even says King David went to sheol. 31 times you'll find it, it just means the grave. In the New Testament, you'll find 10 times the word Hades is translated, the grave, or the word Hades comes out, sometimes hell, but it just means the grave. Gehenna, 12 times, meaning a place of burning. Tartarus is only used one time, and it means a place of darkness. So you find the word 54 times in the Bible, hell. What is God's real purpose in hellfire? He's getting even with these rebellious children, so he's gonna torture them through eternity. Is that his purpose? No, sorry, I'm being sarcastic. Depart from me, cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. God doesn't want anybody there. He is going to destroy Satan and his minions there, but those who choose to follow the devil instead of Jesus, they share in that fate. He's rewarding the devil and his angels, but if we choose to follow them instead of Jesus, we'll share in that reward. Isn't the work of destroying sinners foreign to God's nature? Does the Lord want to take life or give life? Does the Lord like to curse or does he like to bless? Does the Lord like to see suffering? Or did Jesus suffer to take our suffering? This whole idea that God is a sadist is so opposite. It's exactly what the devil wants people to think. The devil wants people to believe this misconception about God because in their heart of hearts, they say, how can I ever really love him? If, if God is going to torture, suppose you've got a loved one that's lost, and you're in heaven, and someone that you dearly loved, parent, spouse, child, and they didn't make it. Let's be honest, not everyone's going to make it. How could you ever feel love for God if you knew somewhere out there, there was a place where he was torturing the ones you loved in this life? Unless God is going to totally make us so that we just don't even think straight and are totally unaware and oblivious. But he's going to demonstrate his love in that he's even going to put the wicked out of their misery because sinners are not happy. The way that God deals with the wicked is actually an act of love. The Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance and accept him and surrender to him and serve him. And you'll find peace, you find joy. He wants you to live, not die. Speaking of the destruction of the wicked, it says, the Lord shall be wroth that he might do his work, his strange work, it's strange to his nature, and bring to pass his act, his strange act. This is strange for God, it's not normal for him. It repulses him, but he has to do it. Can you imagine how a horse trainer feels when he has to walk out on the field? and to dispatch a wounded animal? You think he enjoys that? Or does it break his heart? They do it with tears in their eyes. God is a God of love. He makes life, he delights in new life. He delights in seeing his children happy. 
What kind of parent is it that likes to see their children suffer? And if you have to punish your children, do you enjoy it? Something wrong with you if you do. That'll no doubt turn into abuse. God says, as I live, says the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked should turn from his way and live. And then he appeals and he says, turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways. Why will you die, O house of Israel? Again, the Son of Man has come not to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Jesus wants to save us that we might not perish. Someone might ask this question, shall mortal man be more just than God? When you think about some of these convoluted ideas that people have about the destruction and the punishment of the wicked, the idea that the Lord is going to burn people through all eternity for the sins of one brief lifetime. And if we wouldn't do that to our children, and we wouldn't do that to our dog or even a kangaroo rat, and yet people believe that God's going to do it to his rebellious children, forever and ever he's going to torture them? No. Are you more just than God? That's what Job is asking. Of course not. What are God's post-hell plans for the earth and his people? What is God going to do? Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. And God says, Behold, I will wipe away all tears from their eyes. Now get this, friends. There shall be no more death, get this, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. There shall be no more sorrow, no more pain, no more crying. If God has a torture chamber out there in the universe or down yonder somewhere in the earth where people are tortured and they're burning and writhing and screaming and crying and sorrowful, how can this verse be true? God is making a universe where there's no more sin, no more sinners, no more pain, no more suffering. All things, all things are made new. If sinners are immortalized, those verses aren't true. You see what I'm saying? If the penalty for sin is everlasting torture, then Jesus didn't pay your penalty. This is a very important teaching, friends, because not only does it liberate us in that we realize that God is just and God is fair, it helps us recognize that God is a God of love and that you can trust Him, that we're going to enter a universe where all things are made new. Yes, there is punishment for sin. There's only two choices that we have, life and death. I don't want to suffer my sins, friends. I don't want to experience in the lake of fire what I've done. I am so thankful that Jesus experienced that on the cross for me. And he experienced everything you've ever done wrong or you even may do wrong. Christ suffered for the sins of the whole world on the cross. And you might say, how can one man, he wasn't just a man. God became a man. And that's why it required God. Because only God could suffer for the whole race. He suffered as no one could suffer. And you know what made him suffer the most? He experienced separation from his father. He experienced that eternal separation that the lost will feel. And that's what broke his heart more than anything, why he cried, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That was the cry of the lost. He took all that because he loves each one of us so much because he doesn't want us to perish. Friends, the story of hell is actually good news. It's the good news that Jesus took your hell, if you'll believe. He took your lake of fire, if you'll accept him. He wants you to live. He wants you to have a new life. But you've got to trust him.